the messianic interpretation of the seed of the woman appears in the Targums, where the verse is explained of the Jewish community and its victory over the devil in the days of King Messiah. The reference to the person of Christ was taught by Irenaeus, but was never so generally accepted in the church as the kindred idea that the serpent is the instrument of Satan. Medieval exegetes, relying on the ipsa of the Vulgate, applied the expression directly to the Virgin Mary. And even Luther, while rejecting this reference, recognized an allusion to the virgin birth of Christ. In Protestant theology, this view gave way to the more reasonable view of Calvin, that the passage is a promise of victory over the devil to mankind, united in Christ, its divine head. That even this goes beyond the original meaning of the verse is admitted by most modern expositors. And indeed, it is doubtful if, from the standpoint of strict historical exegesis, the passage can be regarded as in any sense a proto-evangelium. So Skinner really disputes the idea altogether that there was any proto-evangelium here in Genesis 3. But there was a proto-evangelium, at least somewhere in Genesis. There should be. Why? In chapter 5, verse 29, listen to this. This is about Lamech. Now he called the name of his son Noah, saying, This one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. So you can see here in Lamech's words, in his motivations here, you can see that they were expecting a special child. And you can see this elsewhere in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, in the early chapters of Genesis. You can see it elsewhere but this example here is really important. It's really important to understand this. Now, driver is a little more forgiving. He says, the passage has been known for long as the Proto-Evangelium. And no doubt it is that. But we must not read into the words more than they contain. No victory of the woman's seed is promised, but only a perpetual antagonism in which each side, using the weapons which it is natural to it to employ, will seek to obtain the mastery of the other. So Driver would like to accept it as some sort of proto-evangelium, but he admits that really that's probably going beyond the text. And so a lot of scholars have said that. Is there really a proto-evangelium? in Genesis 3. Well, we know there must be some indication somewhere because of Lamech. And I'll show you where it really is. 
There is a true proto evangelium. It's not the passage that people thought, though. It's this passage here. This is where it is. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay. This is the true Proto-Evangelium right here, and nobody knows about it. Nobody out there knows this. Now, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all life. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This is really where the messianic hope springs from. And I'll explain why. First of all, Eve, the man called his wife's name Eve. If you look into it, this means serpent. Skinner talks about it, and I include that note here. And it's an important idea because in the ancient world, they associated serpents with rejuvenation and immortality. This was a connection the ancients made in their mind to the serpent. Not necessarily the Hebrews, but the ancients in general. The serpent was a revered creature in a lot of cultures. And immortality and life is connected with it. This is why the redacting priest mentions here because she was the mother of all life. This priest knows the significance of serpent. Okay? The term translated here, all life, this goes beyond the human being. This goes beyond the human race. And it means all life. Okay, mother. This is why Lamech was looking for this in the birth of a son. It connects to mother. There's significance to mother. And look what the Lord does here. He made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now these garments were the skin of a serpent. They were clothed with snakeskin garments. 
representing life. And Rabbi Eliza talks about this. From the skin which the serpent sloughed off, the Holy One, blessed be he, took and made coats of glory for Adam and his wife, as it is said. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife coats of skin and clothed them. And this is all on the second page in my book. And in the keynote, page two. The snake is commonly associated with selected deities and demons and with magic and incantations in the ancient Near East. The later association is found particularly in connection with the cure or avoidance of snake bites. The most common symbolic associations of the snake include protection, danger, healing, regeneration, and less frequently, sexuality. Another dimension in the Mesopotamian symbolism of the snake is found in the Gilgamesh epic. The animal steals away Gilgamesh's plant of rejuvenation. This episode shows not only the futility of Gilgamesh's quest for immortality, but also explains in folkloric fashion why snakes shed their skin and rejuvenate. The knowledge of this plant is described as a secret of the gods. And it goes on from there. And it says, the snake can signify life and regeneration or death and non-existence. But uh, yeah, that it represents life. That's what the priest is pointing out. And this note here, puts it in your face. Lamech named his son Rest in expectation of the coming one who would restore the axis. I decided to emphasize Lamech naming Noah Rest. That is the clearest example of the expectation of the coming one. There's others, though. But upon what basis was this anticipation had? Eve means snake, but evokes life and immortality. And the Lord clothed the priest and mother with sacrificial snake skins. So, this is the true Proto-Evangelium right here. And you'll have to think on it and think it through. And you'll say, well, golly, this Bruno guy is right. So I made a book. I made a book. I'm sorry I've been gone, but that's where I've been. I've been making a book, and now I want you to have it. And here's the best thing. It's free. It's free. And I want people to understand Genesis. That's all I care about. And so I've made my book. I've made my book. And it is a massive volume of seven pages, folks. 
seven whopping pages, okay? With a three page index. And let me show you how you can access it, download it right now, and it's free. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can look it over, think about it, maybe learn a few things, maybe even agree with me. Who knows? Who knows? I think this could revolutionize things, though. It's the answer. It is the correct answer to the Bible, and I can prove it with the tower. The tower is the ultimate proof. And I plan on making some videos on that soon enough. But take a look at the book and enjoy it. Let me know what you think. And here's how you can find it. Come to Flickr. Flickr.com. Okay. And I will link this address here below under the video. Come to Flickr. And all the pages are right here. It's like a study Bible. This is a pre-Adamite study Bible of Genesis chapters 1 to 11. It's everything you need. And it'll walk you right through it. And there is a three-page chart index that I think you will also find helpful.